Hi, and thanks for joining me for the second last chapter of The Housekeeper's Diary. Now, I did say in the last one that I was going to combine the last two chapters in one video. I've rethought that concept because I've actually had a good look at it. Although they are short chapters, they are very meaty. There is a lot of meat on these bones. <laughs> I think we may want to discuss it. So I don't want to sort of shortchange everybody right at the end of this book. We've, we've done the hard yards. We've done the whole thing. So we should end it properly. So this will be two videos. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to record them back to back. So I'll have the same clothes on, but I'll put them up separately, maybe a day apart. So you can finish off the whole series in a fitting manner. OK, let's get on. So this is chapter 18 and it's titled Final Separation. Now, you know that movie, Love Actually, where you feel so sorry for the Emma Thompson character because she knows that her husband has picked out some jewellery for Christmas for his secretary or personal assistant and she's expecting it and then she gets a Joni Mitchell CD instead, not the jewellery she was expecting. Well, pretty much a similar thing happened to Diana and I'll read it out to you right now. It kicks off this chapter. Diana was in floods of tears in her room. She'd somehow heard about a tray of jewellery specially prepared for the prince to look over regarding his choice of Christmas presents that year and had been mortified by the allocation of gifts. Wonder who the mean person was that told her all about that. Hmm. Whereas a diamond necklace had been marked down for Camilla Parker Bowles, she'd discovered to her horror that she was due to receive a collection of cheap paste Jewels. A bit mean, isn't it? And this is her reaction. I don't want his bloody fake jewels, she cried. I thought cheating husbands took great care to keep their wives sweet with the real things, saving the tawdry stuff for their tarts. She was inconsolable and vowed bitterly that she'll never forgive Charles for anything. Now, Paul Princess Diana had run the gauntlet of bad publicity for several months. There was the publication of the tape with James Gilby, the car salesman. And uh, she really copped a lot of fallout for that. I mean, that's hard. And plus, don't forget, this is after <laughs> the publication of the Andrew Morton book, Diana, The Real Story. So look, she's under siege and whether it's her fault or not, I feel sympathy because to be under siege to that extent would be so hard to manage emotionally. I imagine she would just feel like running away and hiding for the whole terrible thing. So she was pulling out of a lot of planned engagements, pleading exhaustion, and she was generally ill at ease and vulnerable. So all the staff were really surprised that she said in November that she was going to join the Prince and the Royal family at Sandringham for Christmas, but she would stay at Highgrove with William and Harry. Now, this didn't happen and she pulled out at the last moment and it threw everybody into chaos. There had to be different chefs allocated and staff shifted around and <laughs> it caused a lot of problems for everyone. An interesting thing is that Harry had started at day school at, um, oh no, that's boarding, isn't it? Lund Grove School. So he'd left his day school and gone on to Ludgrove where William was. So on Thursday, November 19, Diana and the boys drove straight to Highgrove, leaving the prince and his friends to enjoy a shooting weekend in Norfolk. So that Friday, Diana sat in the kitchen with William and Harry and chatted to Paul and me about her recent trip to Korea with the prince. Now, Wendy Berry points out that the press from that trip had shown basically the couple at war and we can all remember can you remember she had that white outfit on and the black hat with the white trim and she just looked miserable and also of course Prince Charles and then Prince Charles looked absolutely miserable I mean they were just they'd both moved on they had moved on and although Diana said later in the panorama interview that you know there was three in the marriage and she was saying that she was wronged and all that. Look, they had had years and years and years of cheating on each other, uh, Diana with multiple partners, Charles with Camilla. Um, and look, I don't think it really matters who did what, when, what first, because they both had moved on, very much separated and very, very hostile. 
But a happy fun thing happened that weekend, which I'm really glad of because I imagine this is a really sweet memory for William and Harry um, because it sounds so much fun. So it's described as this. The next day, Diana had arranged for a special treat for William and Harry and all her time was given over to her sons. A lorry turned up at the back courtyard in the pouring rain and deposited two motorised go-karts for the children to drive around the estate. Despite the weather, the young princes jumped at the chance and were soon racing each other around the lanes, going up what seemed like a breakneck speed in the appalling conditions. And the princess shouted encouragement from the backyard, her wax jacket dropped dripping with rain, her face flushed with excitement. So that's lovely. I mean, that sounds so much fun. That sounds so much fun. Neither she nor the boys were bothered in the slightest by the weather and all seemed reluctant to cut short their fun for lunch. But nevertheless, they did come into the kitchen area for lunch and the people that actually bought the go-karts on the back of the truck, they were invited to join them for lunch. So it was quite a happy party in the kitchen, around the kitchen table. That lunchtime, the princess took great delight in serving us all drinks and offering us food. She was like any other normal young mother, chatting informally with everyone there and appearing so natural that it must have come as a shock to the couple who'd driven over with the go-karts. So it sounded lovely, absolutely lovely. And like I said, I'm sure that is a cherished memory. That Sunday afternoon, after a blissful weekend, Diana and the boys came through the pantry to say goodbye. You know, what I'm getting from this book is when Diana's good, she's very, very good. And when she is bad, she's horrible. <laughs> like that rhyme we all know. Um, but yes, she definitely had two sides, but she definitely had her really good side. And when that showed, uh, you couldn't help but love her. I mean, you can just tell that Wendy Berry's fallen for her all over again in this chapter. It's interesting, isn't it? She had a lot of, a lot of charm. After thanking Paul and me, she took us quietly to one side and continued. Now this is telling. Whatever happens, I want you to know I've really enjoyed this weekend. It's been very important for me and the boys. With that, she shooed them into the car and drove them back to school. Now, Paul and Wendy Berry sort of looked at each other thinking, oh, goodness, what's brewing? They felt something brewing. Now, the prince was still away at Sandringham. Sorry, it wasn't leading into Christmas. It was November, but it was like a weekend visit. And then I think usually start of December, they all sort of permanently reside at Sandringham leading into the Christmas. Um, so you know, there's something brewing, there's something in the works and there is because there's a phone call from St. James Palace on Tuesday, December the 8th and it was Lady Jane Strathclyde, the personnel officer, saying she would be coming to Highgrove the following day to tell us in person about an important statement. Now, uh, Wendy Berry says that Jane's normally a gregarious sort of bubbly character, but, you know, she could tell on the phone that she was quite subdued and that worried her as well. So they're, they're feeling, you know, they're feeling this tension. And uh, Paul's saying, oh, it's over, isn't it, Wendy? It's finished. You know, he's being dramatic about it all. That evening, the Highgrove telephone lines were ringing with anxious staff from the country wanting to find out if we knew the exact wording of the following day's statement. The palace had wanted to coordinate the announcement to staff so that the news of the separation would be broken simultaneously to every household. But James Strathclyde had not arrived by the time the Prime Minister, John Major, stood up in the House of Commons to deliver a prepared text. And a bit of that is, it was announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. Their Royal Highnesses have no plans to divorce and their constitutional positions are unaffected. And you can look up the full statement, of course, just Google it. Um, but I remember the fallout from that at the time. I mean, people were really impacted by it, really impacted. And a lot of people that were royalists were worried how it would actually impact the security and the stability of the monarchy. But within a few moments of that being sort of aired via the parliament, 
um, James Strathclyde arrived and handed us all a copy of this statement for us to read ourselves. <laughs> They'd already heard it all. She looked very serious and subdued, and none of us realised at the time what further devastating news she had for us all. She indicated that she wished to speak to Paul and Maria alone, and Lita and I went outside. But within seconds, we heard the terrible crying of Maria obviously very distraught by what Jane Strathclyde was actually telling her. And then they heard Maria say in a loud, sobbing voice, I don't want to go back to London. What about our lives? We're all so happy here at Highgrove. And then Paul appeared at the kitchen door. He looked absolutely stunned and distressed. And then he said, we're not wanted here anymore, Wendy. They don't need us anymore. Highgrove's going to be shut down and put into mothballs. I simply cannot take it all in one go. So then it was Wendy Berry's turn to go in. Now this is what she's told. And when you hear this, and then you hear what she finds out later, you can see where some of this simmering resentment of both Charles and Diana would actually come from and what may have prompted her to write this book. Again, I'm not excusing. <laughs> I get told off in the comments quite firmly whenever I'm making excuses for people's poor behaviour, but I'm not. I'm just presenting that understanding that can come with the realisation, with maturity, that people are flawed, very flawed. I'm flawed. You're flawed. We all make mistakes. And so I guess that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to make excuses for bad behavior. I'm trying to understand where that flawed person is coming from and what leads them to that atrocious behavior. So this is what she was told. Wendy, I'm very sorry to tell you that you are no longer required at Highgrove. There's been a division of staff and unfortunately Highgrove will not be used that often by the prince or princess. Frances Simpson, the KP housekeeper, will travel with the prince since she is no longer required at Kensington Palace, and I'm afraid your job here will no longer exist. So she got the sack. Now, she'd been told that she would be paid up until July, but then she would have to be out of the lodge. I had spent eight years there and was not looking forward to making another move. Like Maria, I felt slightly bitter that all of this had been thrust upon us and I dreaded the upheaval in store. Well, it was always hard to be let go from a job. Um, she had just in the last chapter been reassured that she had uh, another few years to go and then she was planning to retire and I think she was planning to save up as much as she could in those two years. So it's always hard when the rug's pulled out from under you, especially when you don't have a lot of money and I get the distinct impression that Wendy Berry does not have a lot of money and she wasn't paid very well to do this job. Also, she makes the point, the fact that it was broken to them a few weeks before Christmas just made the shock all the more worse and plunged them further into depression. That Christmas was Wendy Berry's last one at High Grove. And so the staff party was actually organized at a London restaurant. And this I think was unnecessarily cruel. This, this I thought was really, really sad. Now, it was one of those restaurants where there's several rooms. So you have the main party in one room, but then the overspill of staff would be in the, you know, smaller rooms. It was one of those sort of restaurants. To her horror, she found that she'd been seated away from the main room. And she says, and I quote, it was only then that I really understood the enormity of what happened to me. Because I was due to leave, I'd been sidelined, put on a small table in a side room where I could neither see anyone nor hear the speeches. Jane Strathclyde was by my side. Well, that's nice. I mean, the personnel officer obviously realised how she would feel to be sidelined like that. For, don't forget, for the last eight years, she'd been firmly pride of place in the main room, one of the main people, and she was sidelined in this little back room. And she says it was actually made a lot worse because, <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. I've been, I mean, the whole thing is such a, a farce, really, isn't it? There's just so many emotions running high and so many things happening. Um, but I do feel sympathy for her. 
Um, but David White, who is trying to be kind, I don't know who he was, said he felt really sorry that I'd been left out in the cold. It was difficult to accept what only could be deduced as a snub. But then it got worse. Her whole evening was ruined by something as silly as a seating plan, made worse by the fact that Colin Trimming rushed in and told a policeman at Wendy Berry's table that he'd managed to get him a place where the action was, up the front. I felt desperately miserable, unsure as to why I was being treated so badly. It was the final insult. No, no, we're going to learn in the next chapter that clicks over into 1993, and this really is the final chapter, chapter 19, titled Leaving Highgrove. And we actually find in this last chapter that no, Wendy, no, no, it wasn't the final insult. <laughs> it was more to come. I do wonder, just before I click off and record the next chapter for you, I do wonder whether... The then Prince Charles and Princess Diana had an inkling of what she was up to. Because like I said, I, I got that feeling over the last few chapters that she was almost interviewing disgruntled staff and taking note of what they were saying. So, But if that was the case, you keep your enemies closer. I mean, if they had a real inkling about that, you would think that they would try to part in a more amicable way you would think that maybe they would give her more of a heads up. But then again, they're willing to pay her. This is, you know, Christmas and they're willing to pay her till July of the next year. So, um, you know, that's not an abrupt dismissal. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on there, but I've got to tell you, the last chapter does not disappoint. And I'll see you for that very soon. Bye.